Harrison's Hangout. Harrison on the highway. It is 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 Pacific. Harrison with you, coming to you live from Key West, Florida. want to let you know that in this segment, we're going to be talking to two different people. One is going to roll out your future, how to survive under the hideous talons of the angry eagle called Rick Santorum or whoever or whatever it is. If you're being purged out of your house, if you're having troubles, if you don't understand how this sort of thing could have happened to you, but how to get out of it, that's what we're going to be talking about. There's a big conference happening in March in Berkeley, California, in which much of this was going to be discussed. We're going to be bringing to you in just a couple of minutes a lady who is going to net this out in easy conversational terms so that you could fully understand and walk away with the tools that you so desperately and that I so desperately need because we don't have the adult supervision in the news cycle anymore. We don't have a Walter Cronkite or a Howard Beale as Patty Chayefsky wrote in Network, the award-winning Oscar award-winning movie, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, who deconstructed all of business and the interfrastications between business, government, corporations, and all the corporations that are people, too, by the way. We're going to get into that and have a little fun, plus open up the phone lines, because as always, we have 50 of them for you, and you are always welcome to participate. Then in about 20 minutes, we're going to talk to Zach Moses. He is with Hans Abenstein, Allison Adventures Tours, and what they do is create extraordinary luxury tours uh, for gay folks to travel around our little orb called Earth, and he's heading out uh, in two days to go to Costa Rica himself. I'm looking at him right now. You can't see him, but I can, and I vote yes. And he's going to tell us this cool adventure, how it works, and why he's creating mobile communities in other parts of the world where they wouldn't ordinarily be able to be, where people who might not feel safe to travel somewhere in groups can actually do that and see the very things, the very things that create the kind of culture and texture to life that make it really worth living. So we're going to talk to, in just a couple of seconds, uh, this wonderful lady whose name is Helena norberg Hodge. She's originally from Sweden, so we vote yes for her socialistic tendencies and the fact that she likes to share the toys in her sandbox. And she's going to give us some expert information on this wonderful thing called Creating a Better Economic Future for All, the Economics of Happiness Conference. And economic localization, as uh, she likes likes to point out is the key to sustaining biological and cultural diversity to sustaining life itself and the sooner that we shift toward the local the sooner we're actually going to begin healing our planet our communities and ourselves and this is what she says without further ado as if it were Shakespeare Shakespeare, Shakespeare uh, which you've studied in Sweden I'm sure uh, Helena Norberg Hodge we want to welcome you to the smart show thank you very glad to be here was that a long enough introduction or do you want me to go on another 10 minutes no, thank you. That was perfectly <laughs> not enough. Let's talk a little bit about the cure. The cure of the uh, metastasizing infection that we call the U.S. economy, the global economy, the austerity programs, where the plot of the play is that the taxpayer, who got together at one point and said, let's build a road and we'll all travel on it, and now a couple of people say, let's dig up the road, and then we'll resell the chunks of the road that the taxpayer paid for it. And if he wants to use it, he can go get a camel and ride on it himself. In fact, we'll put down a toll bridge, and he can start to pay, even though he's already paid for it. This kind of thinking, which has become the new normal, but it doesn't need to be that way, does it? It doesn't. But I think in order to understand the cure, it is important that we understand the disease better. And I think it is understanding that for a very long time now, particularly since the Second World War, when governments got together and set up the so-called Bretton Woods Institution, the World Bank, the IMF, and the GATT. The GATT was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And basically what they set up was a system that was feeding economic activity and wealth into the hands of giant mobile corporations and banks the transnational corporations and banks. Basically, since that time, U.S. presidents have increasingly supported the creation of billionaires on the other side of the world while impoverishing their own people. And I'm sorry to say that even in my native country of Sweden, the pressure of these giant international banks and corporations is so big that even there things are shifting and citizens everywhere are now being told 
we cannot afford to look after you. Not just your roads, but your medical care, your, uh, your laws and regulations that would protect you and your environment. Sorry, we can't afford it. And in any case, we're signing on to treaties that make it illegal for us to protect. Protectionism is a dirty word, and it means protecting your citizens and the environment. So we have a very stupid, very blind system. What can we do? I, I say that one of the first things we can do is to realize that we can right away start building and strengthening the local economy. That's something that's happening around the world. It's particularly important to do it around food because we are now in the hands of a system that is separating us further and further from the sources of our food. We're in the hands of a system that subsidizes the giants to literally swap food across the world. And in every local market, it's becoming too expensive for local people to have fresh local food and food from the other side of the world, processed, colored, reconstituted, dead food, costs less than fresh local organic food. And so you know, we, we have we, food disparagement yeah. laws here in the United States where when you make unkind statements about a genetically modified apple, the Apple organization or the humans, the company that owns the apples, because corporations are people too now, thank God, I was waiting for that day and it finally happened and my life is full and rich and I get on my <laughs> knees to them. Those people can actually take you to court and sue you for what's called food disparagement because you insulted yeah. a parsimon. <laughs> and this is part of the reality too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's very grim and I think, I mean, for one thing, I have become convinced that this is mainly happening because of blindness. I have for a long time been talking about the fact that it's less than 1% of the global population that has actually been promoting this deregulation that has made the giants bigger and fatter, that has led to this creation of billionaires uh, around the planet and the impoverishment of the 99%. It's, it's really less than 1% that are really behind pushing this. But sadly, we have an awful lot, most of our government representatives just blindly going along with it. And I'm afraid most of us have been going along with it. We've been not alert to the key area of this global deregulation and the economic globalization, what that leads to. Therefore, we also haven't been alert enough to revitalizing, protecting, and rebuilding the local. But my you know, great good news is that I am incredibly heartened by the localization movement that I see developing around the world, literally all around the world, particularly in the industrialized countries. People are really waking up to the need to rebuild the local. And amazingly, up to a certain point, they have had, um, you know, real success. They are now also, this movement is um, moving beyond food. I mean, one of the key, you know, centerpieces of the local food movement around the world is the starting of farmers markets, where you get a more direct relationship between the producer and the consumer. And it can still mean that you pay too much for fresh local food. We shouldn't have to be paying that much, but it's reducing the price of that and it's increasing the profit to the farmers dramatically. All around that sort of centerpiece of farmers markets, there are edible schoolyards, there are so-called community-supported agriculture schemes, there are um, literally hundreds of different ways that this local food movement is building up. It is far more important than many people realize because you're reducing CO2 emissions, you're reducing packaging, and as, you know, regaining control over a healthy, nutritious diet. So let's, okay. I'm going to just yeah. jump in for a second, and, and I love oh. everything you're saying, because um, I just want to reintroduce you for people who are just joining us right now. We're talking to Helena Norberg-Hodge. She's the director and producer of the Economics of Happiness film. There's going to be a big confabulation going on in Berkeley, California, coming up March 23rd to the 25th at the David Brower Center in Berkeley, and it's a Creating a Better Economic Future for All, the Economics of Happiness Conference. You will be there. People can touch you 
and point and shake your hand and uh, really get the one-on-one -on -one experience of how this thing works. And I think one of the, the disconnects, people don't understand why all of this is happening here. And you mentioned the billionaires are deconstructing civilization as we know it. But we're all taught democracy is the single most important thing in the world. Why? We have to attack Iraq for democracy. Therefore, using the syllogism, if P, then Q, right? Except it's more like if P, then um, fill a bucket, right? Or something. I love my colorful metaphors. They're slightly out of control, but I thank you for your confidence here. So using the syllogism, that would mean, as a democracy, who the hell's voting for this crap? Ten people over there? Because I'll tell you, of 307 million Americans, and now the 7 billion humans on Earth, the 7th billion born two months ago, of all of them, we're not getting together in one gargantuan orgasmic plebiscite and deciding, you know, fuck us. Let's help Timmy over there at the top. Yeah, so yeah. is this democracy somehow? Well, you know, they, as you know, we've got to look at the media. We've got to look also how that same media and those same ideas are getting into schools. I mean, virtually every avenue of information and knowledge is now corporatized. And in deep and insidious ways, it's supporting this notion that there is only this direction because it turns out that left and right have become very insignificantly different in terms of the real structures that we need to be looking at. It's local versus global. It's the fabric of community and interdependence and connection. It's our connection to the living world, which is being seven. I mean, we need to be thinking of parties as being those who believe in community and those who are destroying it. And that, it turns out, I have to say, if I look more deeply, even in Sweden, in its heyday, in its socialist industrial heyday, it had bought into a model of centralized control. At that time, it was more government centralized control, but it had broken down the fabric of real interdependence, family, and very importantly, the community structures. It had broken down the smaller scale multitude of businesses and farms that can provide for most of our basic needs. For Did, everything when, that we have. When yeah. looking at, at America yeah. right yeah. now, and, and, yeah. and I love what you're saying here, and yeah. it's just the nature of this format where I have to jump in now and then and step on your toe, yeah, and do. I'm not please meaning do. to be impolite. But we're talking to Helena norberg Hodge. She's the director and producer of the Economics of Happiness film. There's going to be a Creating a Better Economic Future for All Happiness Conference, March 23rd to 25th of this year in Berkeley, California. And as we look at this, we have the Occupy movements all over the world. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy LA, Occupy San Francisco, Occupy uh, Berkeley, right, up there. Is this the beginning of worldwide revolutions, tiny as they are? I think that the Occupy movement is obviously incredibly important. And it's a giant step in the right direction because they are articulating the problem of the corporate control of our governments. You know, if you look at the Tea Party, you have a lot of conservatives, you know, with a small C, you know, small business. And David Koch. Who are, you know, who only see the government and are furious and see waste in government. They don't see that behind the government is this corporate and banking system that is the real and big problem. And of course, it's a very big problem that governments are servicing them instead of us. And so once we understand the bigger picture and see more how the system works, I think it becomes clear what we need to do. So the, the localization strategy is about doing what we can at the local level. And remember, the minute we turn the I into a we, the minute we just join up with a few people where we live to start thinking through these issues, I hope looking at a film like ours, and there are many good docos coming out now that spell out some of these issues, really trying to understand that, but, and then taking action as a we, as a together community group. We can do a lot. And I also just want to stress that once we link up with others and once we help our children also to connect more to nature, we've already started a cultural shift that will bring greater joy. 
than the current, you know, dominant consumer culture path where we're passive and just spectators. But also we need to be joining the Occupy movement, linking to that, you know, those who are worried about the dolphins, those who are worried about global warming, anyone, and it's a big universe of anyone who's doing something to make the world a better place. Let's link up to look at the economic policy changes we need. They're fairly simple. We need to re-regulate the global, deregulate the local. That may sound a bit radical right now, but that what we've been seeing is the inverse. We are over-regulated at the local level. That's why so many right-wing people get so fed up, because they think that comes from the left. It comes from the corporate lobby behind the scenes. They know that over-regulating smaller businesses, farmers, all of us, feeds into their profits. They are, the meanwhile, globally being deregulated, doing the production in China and India. And so we have to see through that. We need to deregulate the local and re-regulate the global. We need to shift taxes and subsidies to support the local. We should be allowed to invest in our own community. At the moment, we have regulations that prevent that. We should be allowed to enrich our own economies and our own communities worldwide. That's what the... That's what we're talking about. I love it. I love it. And as we wrap up, I, I want to thank you so much, uh, Helena Norberg Hodge. And where can people see the documentary apart from just the Happiness Conference? Please come to our website, theeconomicsofhappiness.org. Be sure to put the the in, the economics of happiness, one word, dot org. And there you'll find you can. Uh, do get by the DVD, and there are various screenings around the country. So, uh, and we sometimes have free screenings on the web. Eventually, it will be free completely. We still have to recoup some of the six hundred thousand sure. we had to spend making. Absolutely, it. we've got graphics that display all of this. Uh, I just wanted to hear it in your lovely Swedish voice. And Thank you wishing you huge success on the conference. Any way that we can pop up there uh, and poke our head in, we certainly will. If not, we'll send some of our secret agents to pop in and witness the Please event. Do. And Please we're do. so glad we're so glad you're doing this. It is such a critically necessary move. And any chance that we get to expose living, breathing humans uh, on the planet who actually give a damn, uh, we vote yes. Well, there's always nothing more important than alternative media, so I'm very grateful to you for what you're doing. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us today on The Smart Show, thesmartshow.org. Harrison with you. We, are, of course, are talking to our audiences on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, 93.7 in San Diego, 99.5 in Central California. Also on multiple uh, platforms, including Facebook and Twitter and everybody, everywhere else, and even some we don't even know about that might be doing wretched things with the video. But we don't mind because we're a free speech kind of joint. Thank you again so much, Helena Norberg Hodge. Again, the conference is March 23rd to the 25th, 2012, at the David Brower Center in Berkeley, California. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, you know we'll put the good mojo out there so you have a nice tailwind as you sail us into success. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Harris, with you. We are now turning to. Actually, if you want to just slide in a little bit, we'll get a little cozy here. Turning in, I want you to say hello to, this is Zach Moses. And Zach is with Hans Abenstein Travel, also known as Allison Adventures, which is a, a very old brand of incredible travel that's uh, particularly suited for a particular group of people. And tell us a little bit, Zach, about what it is you get to do. Um, we are... <clears throat> We're the original gay tour operator. So what we did is starting 40 years ago, Hans Ebenstein actually did the very first all-gay male tour. And back then they were actually called Tours for Discerning Gentlemen because this was a very taboo sort of tour to do. Uh, Sasha Allison started Allison Adventures in 1995. And about eight, eight or nine years ago, the companies merged together when Philip Sheldon bought both the companies. And what we do is we actually take a group of gay men from all over the world and we put them together and we have our little gay community say in Costa Rica which is where I'm going to be in a couple of days hosting one of our groups so it's uh, it's really amazing product and just the way that we 
um, you don't have to you don't have to come out of the closet. You know, when you're on a, when you're when you're gay or you're in a gay couple, you have to go on a tour and then wonder when it's safe to actually come out to the people in your group. And here you're just sort of pre-qualified and everybody knows who everybody else is and it's really a comforting safe environment for people to be in. You know what's particularly nice, and I'm just going to switch back here, talking with Zach Moses of Hans, you pronounce it Ebenstein? Ebenstein. Uh, Eben, Ebenstein. Very gringoized. I like it. <laughs> Hans Ebenstein Travel. You'll see the graphics right here, and you'll see, you saw graphics earlier over there, some B-roll, some pictures of various different locations that you guys go. And I think one of the things that I really love about this is you make it portable. You take a community, you actually put it together and invent it, because unless you're in a place like Key West, where we are right now coming to you live, and you saw some of the exciting video on the flat panel monitor behind me, that I think was a beautiful companion to uh, Helena Norberg-Hodge as she talked about Occupy France. Um, and one of the well, things that was, you do was the is economics you... of happiness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My kind of economics of happiness. Well, you know, there obviously must be a reason it was on the TV. It wasn't my DVD. <laughs> and one of the cool things that you get to do, Zach, is you create a community where there was none. Yeah. So let's say you say Costa Rica, poof, or poof, if you want to <laughs> pronounce it that way, and suddenly shows up 20, 30 people who never in a million years would have had a chance otherwise to meet each other. And that's M-E-E-T or M-E-A-T, depending <laughs> how the hell we want to spell it. And, and I guess there's even romance, potentially. Well, yeah. Like, for instance, the, the tour that I'm about to go on is our Valentine's tour in, in Tortuguero. So our New Year's tour, which just happened in Tortuguero, Costa Rica, was uh, mostly couples who actually went. But you'll find on the Valentine's group, it's actually all single men who are on the group. And... We do, we have, everybody can sign up to have a single supplement where they're in their own room, but most men on the singles tour actually opted to have us find them a roommate. And that roommate rotation happens, and there is potential for something to happen. Some men just like to be in the comfort of a, of a gay group, but we actually have a few who have met their partners that they're now married to, if that's legal where you live, or... Our tours. You know what I think is brilliant about that, Zach, is that you're creating a safe place for people to meet each other. If they go to a bar and get drunk and somebody puts some GHB and some <laughs> crystal meth in their drinking water, you know, it may not have the ending that they had planned, or it may have twice the ending that they had planned. But on this kind of trip, it's organized, it's structured. There's exercise, there's nature, there's the outdoors, there's social interaction, something many of us have forgotten how to do, just beyond saying hello, but to have to eat a meal with somebody and engage them in conversation and be charming. I mean, this, I think it's a very healthy thing. Well, yeah, like I was just in uh, the Loire Valley of France in September, and the group, we all went in, and there were these little small French village that you would never actually expect there to be any gay scene, there wouldn't be gay bars, there would be nothing gay except we went in and we would take control of the room and we, we've just turned it into our portable gay community and you would sit down and we all hear about how in France they'll sit down to a dinner of, at, for three hours but as a tourist you are there and you're not going to sit down for three hours because who are you going to talk to? And and we quickly find other common ground and you immediately have your best friend chatting and talking about everything talking to Zach Moses he is with Hans Evanston Travel Evanston Travel um, I just say it the German way because I knew Sasha Allison the guy who started Allison Adventures and actually went on some, some tours with him in Switzerland. And everyone pronounced it Abenstein because they're Swiss. <laughs> so that would be one alternative. And I see Yvonne, who is at the bottom of our screen here. And Yvonne, you, I believe, are a straight woman. Is that correct? That would be a yes. Yes, I am. Ah, sign language. Unfortunately. Now, 
doesn't this sound I like was born fun? this way. There, there, it happens in nature, I'm told. Yes. An extra X chromosome or <laughs> yes. a dangling Y modifier. Yes. Doesn't this sound like fun? Yes. It's like a camping trip for, for gay grown-ups, yeah. right? I mean, really, that's what it is. And they have kind of straight variations, but I don't think as many. I just think maybe it's a little scary for a lot of people. And I, would, I think it takes a little bit of courage to actually show up for your life like that. Yeah, it's... um. For for a lot of people, you know, we get a lot of people who join us on these trips, and they, in their lives back home, have to live what appears to be a straight life, and to to actually come out and be able to, just like that, you are, you're in a gay community. You are, and everybody knows you're gay. You're out, and it's comfortable, and there's nobody who's judging you. And, you know, there have been the occasional time that a straight person has actually joined our tour because it was somebody's brother. <laughs> and, but we always know that when that happens, it's kind of, we know that it's safe. We know that it's somebody who's very pro-gay because they're connected to somebody who's gay. Well, I, we're turning the shot here. So you can see a variety of different scenes from Hans Evanston Travel, also known as Alice in Adventures. You can go to the website. You see the graphics on your screen. You're seeing pictures here right now. And you're seeing what Zach Moses is telling us about. And what are some of the destinations you go to? We're not talking about, you know, yeah, we go to Palm Springs, by gosh. It's more than that, isn't it? Yeah, well, we're actually going to places like the Grand Canyon where we're taking... 14 gay guys and we're putting them on a boat away from all of their technology no cell phone no no ipad nothing because you'll ruin it it's how wet. do they survive you know a lot of them have a little bit of a panic attack at first <laughs> you see billy up there with the batman logo he's, he's, he, yeah. Yeah, a few, a few guys actually panicked. <laughs> I think I mentioned it to you, and you you sort of started to panic when I mentioned that trip. And it's uh, people we're, we're totally connected to to everything and to everybody and social media and everything. And to actually step out of it for <clears throat> just one week, just one week, and be a mile down in a crack, you you know, it really changes everything for you. I would think being a mile down in a crack would change it for me. <laughs> And I vote yes to that, by the way. What is the most exotic trip you've ever been on, Zach Moses? The most exotic trip that I have ever been on? Honestly, I, it's our French tours. They're, you have no idea. Most people, when they think of France, they think of Paris. And you've got all the statues, naked statues. They're hot. They're plated in gold. It's amazing. You can go to the Louvre and see the naked statues. That's the only thing I took any pictures of, which was a bad job for me in marketing because I should have taken more pictures. But anyway, you you get outside of Paris, and it's like fairy tales. It's everywhere you go. It's just perfect little fairy tales. Fairy tales? The tales of fairies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is this is a double entendre. I'm 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 doing this purposely. No, it's but the fairy tales that happen in fairy tale lands. Yeah, yeah. There's fairies in fairy tale land. It's perfect. Um, but it's it's the the food, the the people. They don't speak any English, and that's okay because unlike what you hear it's about. Oh, that's Congress. <laughs> Well, when when you hear about people talk about Paris, it's it's they say, well, they speak English, but the the French, oh, they don't they don't want to try to speak English. We know that they can speak English because they're in France. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very American centric of us. But when you get in the countryside, they don't speak English, but they try and they try to communicate with you, and they're the friendliest people you've ever met, and just the charm of the region, which, if you're gay you probably would never go out into that region because as charming as it, as it is, it's the French equivalent of the Bible Belt in the U.S. And so even though it's, there's not going to be gay bashing, it is their rural communities that might be more conservative. And we're creating this for you. And where else would you get to see that? Uh, you go out there, you get to see where the Romans had gone in and conquered. You get to see ruins. Just as when you go to England and you go to Bath, England, and see the, the Roman baths, and you start to understand the history lesson, certainly as religion factors in, how 
Christianity started to evolve, conquering the British Isles. You had these pagans running around worshipping the sun, because there's three days of it in the UK, and by God, what's bigger than the sun? And so you incorporate that into your, your language and into your culture and all the rest of it, and you start to see how this works. Turkey, likewise, if you go to Istanbul, and you go below the street level and you see these wonderful cisterns where the water supply hundreds of years ahead of everybody else technologically amazing stuff you, and this is in turkey where maybe pulling out your penis in the intersection is not going to get you a gold star where else would you get to see it unless you traveled with a like school of fish well, the, the other thing that's nice, too, is we're going to expose you to all the little things that you didn't realize about those communities that are a little bit gay. So when you're getting our history tour, you're going to find out, that, yeah, this was this famous Roman leader who was here, but here, here was his lover, and this is what his lover did. And his lover was a man, by the way. And Hadrian, the, the friggin' Emperor Hadrian. You go to um, uh, Ephesus, and you see the oldest surviving ruins of this magnificent this the cradle of human civilization an area where the fucking wheel was invented right and this guy was a nancy boy that's right there was <laughs> buggery well and it's 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 the same in israel in, in israel we have gone out of our way to use uh the supplier that we use he, him and his partner were among the first couples to be recognized as legally gay married in israel and they found a little loophole in the law that said if you got married outside of Israel and it was a legal marriage there, Israel has to recognize it. So the Supreme Court said, we have to recognize your marriage. And now gay marriage is legal in Israel. And we go down and we learn the history like Masada, which is a very famous, very famous in Roman and Jewish religion. And it's, it's, on, it's, it's on the Dead Sea and it's this fortified mansion, crumbling ruins on top of this plateau that overlooks the water and they had these cisterns that would direct the flash floods and the water into there and as interesting as that is and amazing as it is my favorite part was actually learning about the ruins of the bathhouse and all the history of you know this is all men in this bathhouse that are hanging out here and they have their wives but there's a little bit of a scale in the way the Romans were thinking and so you also see all of the little coins where they've written their names and you're like these are all these are all men sort of throwing their keys into a into a bowl and who are we pulling to go home with well it's interesting when we uh, and, and we're looking by the way at pictures of different places you can go with Hans Evanston travel also known as uh, Allison Adventures you can just google allisonadventures.com or Hans Evanston go to uh, he travel.com h e travel HeTravel.com. You can see the website. We have it listed there. You're seeing images right on the uh, right side of Zach here. And when we look at history, and it's always fascinating, and I think that's what's fun, particularly fun, about this whole notion of traveling and seeing the rest of the world. Let's take Plato, the philosopher, right? Or Plato, as we like to call him here in the U.S. This guy, you know, he and Socrates, they were the Mac Daddies, right? Yeah. And in Plato's dialogues, which is about this thick, there, a third of the thing is how to pick up a 16-year-old boy. This is Plato. And then we have platonic <laughs> love, whatever the hell that is, right? But as, as Gore Vidal, one of the greatest historians who's ever lived, um, and other such like-minded people who actually have a brain, get this, it works. They will tell you that people will do whatever they feel they can get away with. And, and history talks about that. In Rome, famously, over your door, the more money you had, the larger the penis figurine you nailed on top of your door. That's how you knew people were rich. They had wooden penises hammered above the door. Perfectly normal in Rome. Yes. Now, I did that as a news story a few years ago, and you would have thought I had burnt down a TV station. Which I did, really, in that story, but... The truth always hurts. And the good news for all of this is not only are you getting to see the world, but I think it actually changes your life in a lot of fundamental ways. Yeah. The, um, uh, a, a nice little aside that I was thinking about as you were talking about the cultures and how they would nail the penises, etc. Uh, Hans Evanston 
in his early tours in Egypt, which was one of the first places he went to, he was he was very famous for his line that he would give opening up to everybody, which was in Egypt there are no gay men, but every Egyptian man participates in gay sex. Right. You'll you'll see right above me the Hans uh, Evanston banner with all the information right there, so uh, you can get all the information you want and be able to go to one stop. And and he's right. Actually, I'm going to modify that statement a little bit because it's a more modern era than when he was first in Egypt. I don't think they engage in gay sex because I think gay is more of a cultural thing. Judy Garland, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a cultural thing. But but it, but same sexual or pansexual or like sexual or I just like pansexual. You know, it, it could be a woman tomorrow, right? Yeah. So, so there's like this this human spectrum, the right person and it works. And 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 that's all I have to say about that. But we know it's actually true. Like I would think in your travels you learn a lot about people. That it's not what we see sort of as the official story, that there are shades of gray and people aren't quite sure. But once somebody gets congruent with their nature, whatever that is, and if your nature is to be a great tennis player and you actually really, really don't squander that talent, but start to practice to become a great tennis player and become congruent with your hardwiring that way, you can become a great person. And I'm guessing that what you do, providing this travel, providing this intellectual and philosophical, emotional, and if there were another word that I could come up with, I'd throw it in there, that level of stimulation, it really converts people. Yeah, we actually, about 50% of our travelers every year are repeat travelers who have been with us in the past because once you go on one of our tours, you're sort of stuck. You can't really... You can't really go on another tour without feeling a little bit let down. You stalk? Is that what happens? <laughs> yeah, sort of. We, we knock on your door. We send you incessant emails reminding you who we are. No, we're actually very friendly with that. In fact, when you sign up on our website for our newsletter, because it's gay travel, occasionally about one in every ten sign-ups is um, some jackass who's signing up their friend as a practical joke. And it... You know, these these people get very upset, and we're very strict on one click, and you'll never hear from us again. And when people call us, we apologize. And, and it's, you know, one part of that sucks that there's so many people who would be offended because we're not sending out gay porn to people. We're just sending out tour information, and these tours happen to be gay. And these are tours that are making people's lives more comfortable and making them feel safe to travel around the world. And we are really we're we're sort of like your professional trip advisor for the gay community billy you had a comment you wanted to make why don't you share that with us he's the one that reacted so violently when you talked about no ipads or phones <laughs> so basically if you want to join a travel group where you're not the gay couple you're just the new couple you should join one of the tours exactly we um we are like the like I was saying earlier, we're we're your, we're your trip advisor. You could go and you could. We've been doing it for forty years. We've been figuring out where it's safe, how it's oh, great. Safe. Is it moisturizing or? Yeah, you know, actually, I exfoliate <laughs> every night with sand. I have handfuls of sand and I <laughs> scrub my face. I'm really actually quite old. <laughs> well, so you guys have nearly a half a century of life experience. So whatever issues happened four decades ago they've been long resolved so you're really hitting constant home runs I would imagine yeah and the world has become a much safer place for gays and lesbians to travel because everybody realized how much deeper our pockets are than everybody else's <laughs> so <laughs> take notes <laughs> even the most straight hotels are will will put on a show of being gay friendly and sometimes they're not but they'll put on a show of being gay friendly and that is where people like us come in handy because we we're your filter who are making sure that you're not being gay gouged gay gouged <laughs> I love it hey listen I want to thank you so much we're talking to Zach Moses and we're just gonna wrap this up here talking about taking international tours where there really is no limit I suppose if you could create going to the moon it's not doable yet, but if Newt Gingrich has his way, 
we're all going to be on the next spaceship out there. Um, if you could do that, you would, and you have all kinds of people that would actually go. I mean, I, and I, it can't be cheap to do this, but it's it's affordable, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's actually very affordable. And act, the truth is, what has always amazed me is a lot of times someone will sign up for a tour that's say a twenty three hundred dollar tour, and then when I see the cost of their plane ticket, they flew international business class, and it was five thousand dollars for the ticket. And I was actually amazed that they're getting two weeks somewhere for half the price that they paid for that plane ticket that flung them across the planet. They must have taken baggage on the plane. Yeah, a lot of baggage. <laughs> and a lot of baggage, too. So, to wrap it up, you're going to Costa Rica this weekend, and what's the itinerary? Well, we actually we, we start in San Jose, and we'll probably visit, say, a gay bar or a strip club in San Jose to sort of introduce everybody to the gay life of San Jose. The next morning we'll go to Tortuguero, which is only accessible by boat. So we actually have to come in on rivers that have been likened to like the Amazon. And then we stay at this eco lodge for two nights. It's Caribbean, black sand beaches. This is where the, the turtles lay their eggs. The we, volcanoes had been ground up, the volcanic uh, creating the black beach. Yeah, and it's very, very picturesque, beautiful beaches, crystal clear water. From there, we're going to move, and we spend two days in Sarapiki, which is where we're going to zip line through the rainforest canopy, and we will also go whitewater rafting while we're there. It's not fair! <laughs> and then we'll move on to RNL Volcano which we stay in a really fancy luxury resort that has uh, thermally heated pools and you can get massages. And this is, this is after the eco tours, we're like, this is a gay group. We have to go and get them their massages and their oils and everything. They have muscle tension. Exactly. We, they got to work that out of those shoulders. And then we, we tour the Venado Caves, which are these living caves that formed 20 million years ago. And we do hanging bridges. And we we see the volcano itself, which is an active volcano. Everyone hears about the volcano in Hawaii that's active, and we tend to think that that's it. And it's not. There's Iceland. There's there's Aranau. They're all over the world. There are there are volcanoes that are doing fireworks every night. And so we we watch that, and then we return into San Jose after a couple of days there and wrap our trip up. I love it. You totally totally have. I mean, I have to go do one of these somehow, some way. We must, as Captain Picard would say, make it so. Because I would love to like do something live or, or live to tape or something there and show people, show people what you do. Because it just sounds stellar. And but don't we have to experience so that we can tell everyone what it's like? I mean, we have to review, right? Yeah, of course. <coughs> well, I was trying to convince you to go on our Grand Canyon well, trip. I, I, you know what? I sure. How's that? Was that hard? And but. How are you going to handle it if you don't have any here. technology? I don't know. I'll, I'll have to handle it. Well, you know, it'll give it... This, this, my finger is pointing at the finest technical mind this side of the Mississippi, which is really north of here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He'll figure it out, trust me. I want to thank I'll still be connected. Connected. <laughs> Zach Moses, who is with Hans Ebenson Travel, and you can go to hetravel.com, he, H-E, he travel.com and get all the information you can sign up you get newsletters all this stuff and I'm sure you run uh, promotions and specials here and there as makes sense for you guys and there's something for everybody and I think that's the key thing even if you're maybe more on the mature side of the world that doesn't mean you can't participate right our age groups that are on our tours for instance the tour I'm about to go on we have guys on this one, the youngest age is 28, and the oldest age is 68. So we actually get a big, wide range. The sort of median age is about 40 to 45 on most of our tours. Awesome. I want to thank you, Zach Moses. You can see all the graphics on there, and uh, have a wonderful time. I know you're going to have a blast, and we will all be hideously jealous. But we will chase you down and uh, do the Grand Canyon trip. And uh, Hans Abramson Travel, hetravel.com. This has been Zach Moses. I want to thank everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. TheSmartShow.org. And don't forget, this Monday on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, 93.7 in San Diego, 99.5 
in Central California, also streaming on WeHo News, uh, as well as multiple platforms, including Facebook and everywhere else. We are going to be doing uh, some special programming simultaneous to the pledge drive going on uh, in public broadcasting. So we're going to be giving you some frisky programming as well, two hours from 3 to 5 on <coughs> Monday. Until then, I want to thank everybody, and as always, a moist regards from Key West. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, you guys. Bye.